My name is Dick Lee, and I have the pleasure of welcoming you here tonight to the second annual um, Seattle Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame. This really, thank you to you folks. This is really a big deal. I had a dream about doing something like this a while back, 10 years ago, about three different superintendents and similar number of athletic directors. And thank God for Eric McCurdy, Dr. Flip Herndon, and Dr. Nyland, because they said, you know, the only way we're going to shut them up is let them go ahead and deal with it. <laughs> so we have our second one. And this is 139 years of history. If you think about it, 13 schools, because there was Lincoln, who's coming back, Broadway and Queen Anne, but 139 years, 13 schools, 20 to 23 sports per school, it's pretty daunting. And certainly for the class who made it last year, there were 23, and this year we're blessed to have 14. So it's just pretty special, and I want to say thank you to all of you at coming and being a part of tonight. So one of the challenges of doing something like this is to find a perfect MC. Well, we're blessed because we have two perfect MCs. The first MC that was perfect was last year's city council president, Bruce Harrell. But since we're going to hear from him later, we're not going to let him have that much time at the mic. <laughs> but we are really blessed to welcome in a minute here the person single-handedly responsible for making the Seattle Storm world champions. Well, there were some players and some coaches. There was a lot of people. But I tell you, the, the, along the way, in your program, you'll see there's a, a little bio on Miss Karen Bryant. And I've had the pleasure of knowing her a little while. And as you know, when you work and do these things, you find every so often a person who is really committed, really dedicated, and is just a, a real gentle, kind person. So we're blessed to have tonight Karen Bryant, a legend in her own mind. She's in another county. She's in the Snohomish County Hall of Fame. So it's, you know, they have a much smaller ceremony. I think, is it at Dick's? But no. She is a legend, and we want to welcome Karen Bryant to the podium to take the next step. You can bring your wine and eat dinner. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dick. I have um, been at many events like this. I will say I've never been an MC, so we'll sort of work on my comedic timing and see if I can live up to the legend that is Bruce Harrell and the act that he performed last year, which I'm sure was quite dubious. Um, I've never been called the legend. I've never been called perfect, nor have I ever been referred to as gentle or kind. But uh, nonetheless, I'm here with you tonight. I am a lover of athletics. Uh, for everything that I have accomplished in my life, all that I am as a, a human being, as a sister, as a partner, as a mother, I owe much of that to athletics. I have had the pleasure of having just about every role you can have in athletics. I was a fan, I was a player, I was a coach, I was an executive for 18 years, certainly a community ambassador, uh, and now I get to experience sports through the eyes of my nine-year-old daughter. Uh, those of us in the room are either athletes or athletic supporters, so we know, we all have in common that we understand the power of athletics. The life lessons and experiences that athletics uniquely offers. Uh, obviously, academic experience is extremely profound in how it shapes young people, and athletics is the perfect complement to that, and all of us have our own stories. I am thrilled to be here tonight. I don't get to do this as much as I did in my 18 years in women's pro basketball, and I miss sort of being in front of um, folks who appreciate, deeply appreciate and understand the, the power that is sports. So uh, again, Dick, thanks for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and to all the honorees, and I'm, I'm thrilled that I have a personal connection 
um, with many of them. Certainly Tara, Tara and I both played women's basketball at University of Washington. I watched her as a young woman and, and not only got to know her and still consider her a dear friend, but her, her wonderful mother who's also here tonight. Oh, and Sean, you're here too, her sister. <laughs> Um, Sheila, I obviously was a huge, huge fan of yours, and you know, congrats on your WNBA career following your high school career. Mario Bailey and I, there are many Huskies. Mario and I were at UW at the same time when we won that co-national championship in 1991. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Debbie Armstrong and her daughter and, and just got to match that by meeting her parents this evening. Um, Bruce and I uh, certainly tried to play our part in keeping the Sonics in Seattle. Um, and although we, we failed, I know Bruce has been a huge advocate in his role as a city council member on the power of sports and has worked tirelessly to uh, convey that message to anyone who will listen. So, Bruce, I really appreciate all the hard work that you have done throughout the years to advocate for the power of sports for our community. Um, Uh, I now have the pleasure of, of calling to the stage our esteemed uh, athletic director, Eric McCurdy. Thank you, Karen. I wrote down some notes. Actually, I was out of town at a conference last couple of days, and Kim Smanky, Kim wave at me. She's here somewhere. She's our communications manager for the district, and so... Uh, she wrote up a little something for me for the next individual that I'm going to present, and so I'm going to read it. The problem is I didn't bring my glasses. <laughs> well, when you're dumb, you're dangerous on this stuff. So I'm going to read this. Bear with me. Now I have the pleasure of introducing a very special person, the head of the largest and best school district in the state of Washington, or as I like to think of him, the top coach. I know that tonight it's about celebrating excellence in athletics, but it wouldn't be a proper introduction without shining a spotlight on some of the victories Dr. Nyland has led the district uh, to at this point. Many of us in this room know it from personal experience, but Seattle Public Schools is recognized nationally as a high-performing major urban school district. Under his leadership, the district has made significant gains that our students are learning and how well they are succeeding after graduation. Our third graders outscored the statewide average on the English language arts test by 10 percentage points. In math, our eighth graders have a 15 percent point lead over their peers statewide. 71 percent of the class of 2016 were enrolled in college during their first year after graduation. I think that's very impressive. Dr. Nyland has put a full court press, I like that, Smanky, put a full court press on eliminating opportunity gaps for students of color. He has been willing to go to the mat for our kids. As a result, our district graduation rate is on the rise. The gap between the Caucasian and African American students are clo is closing. 11 of our schools this year were recognized as schools of distinction. Four of our schools led the state in eliminating academic gaps for students of color. Seattle piloted President Obama's My Brother's Keeper, a mentorship program that has resulted in improved attendance and academic achievement for African American students. Finally, Dr. Nan has kept his eye on the ball and guided Seattle Public Schools through some tough times. He led us through a labor strike, a serious budget deficit, and installed a belief that every student in every classroom, every day matters. Please join me in welcoming our superintendent, Dr. Larry Nyland. Thank you, Eric. I would like to uh, introduce uh, our board members who are here tonight. President Leslie Harris. And Director Jill Geary. And thank you uh, to our board for keeping their eye on the ball, keeping the focus on, uh, as I say often, four goals, four years, student achievement, so uh, thank you to them. Well, uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to the committee who's done uh, all of the heavy lifting for making tonight uh, a wonderful uh, event and occasion. Uh, as a graduate of Roosevelt High School, I uh, 
didn't uh, participate very much in sports, but certainly sports are an important part of the culture and climate and the shared memory of education. And so uh, this is a trip down memory lane for me and many of you who have such a long uh, history in Seattle schools. So thank you again to uh, our honorees. Uh, thank you for uh, those who are here uh, to join us in celebrating. And uh, we're going to have a great evening. Thank you, Superintendent. I have a few people that I want to recognize, so please bear with me. When you put on an event like this, there's so many people to celebrate. Uh, I want to make sure that I do that. First, I would like to recognize two people from an inaugurational class from last year, Ms. Pat Trish Bostrom and Dr. Charles Mitchell. Would you please stand up and be recognized? Also, would like to recognize the Hall of Fame committee. Would you please stand as well? Tara Davis, Pat McCarthy, Dr. Flip Herndon, Mary Ann Baker, Pat Bostrom, John Buller, Ernie Dunstan, Bob Flowers, Bruce Harrell, Dick Lee, Chip Lightham, Dan Rayleigh, Dr. Amy Singh, and Sue Verdine. Please recognize them as well. I don't know, Amy, where is Amy? See. Amy, please stand up again. As, as with our student athletes from each high school from the table that Debbie, uh, that Amy has, has done twice, it's the second year in a row, she has sponsored a table for our student athletes. Would you please recognize Amy and our student athletes? <laughs> there they are back over there, please stand up. I want to also thank the WAC, the 101 Club, uh, John Buller for hosting us. This is such a great venue. And we really appreciate and enjoy um, being hosted here. I want to take a quick second to thank someone that has been instrumental to the Metro League. When you talk about Seattle Public Schools, we're the largest mixed public and private league in the state. Um, we did something this year, just like we're innovative on the teaching and learning side of the house, we're also innovative in educational-based athletics. And we did something this year for the first time in the history of this state. We mixed, usually we play publics on one side, private schools on the other, and we come together at the end and have the Metro Championships. Because of some of the serious challenges regarding football, Seattle Public Schools and the Metro League took a very big initiative this year, and we mixed the public and private schools together for two reasons, for safety and competitive balance. The result of that was that three of the four teams that were in the semifinals of the state this year uh, were from our league. Rainer Beach, who were in the finals, who had never been. Garfield was in the semifinals, they had never been. And of course, O'Day High School won the championship. But this individual has been very instrumental in keeping the public and private schools together. He's a great friend. He doesn't like to be called on, but I'm going to embarrass him because he's a great guy. Please recognize Coach Monty Kohler from O'Day High School. I'd also like to recognize the gentleman next to him, the president of O'Day, Jim Walker. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for being here as well. When you talk about the heavy lifting in our office um, that made this happen, there's a lot of people that were involved. I want to quickly just name those people because they're very important to me as part of our team. Tara Davis, Kalani, Stephanie are here. Would you please recognize them as well? And Travis, and Travis. I want to also hello, say hello to a friend of mine, the head of the NAACP, the president, Mr. Gerald Hankerson. And lastly, someone that has supported me publicly and privately, Ms. Joanne Harrell. Dick Lee will come back up a little later and talk about our Hall of Fame and some of the things that we're asking um, you to participate in, but there's two areas that I wanted to quickly talk to you about uh, that I think they're important. When you talk about educational-based athletics for Seattle Public Schools, one of the biggest challenges that we have are transportation costs. Um, the district is focused on teaching and learning, and I see uh, people in the building like Coach Kevin Winecoop, and I call him Coach because he's a third-generation 
uh, Ballard product, but he also coached girls basketball there. I see John Halfacre, I call him coach as well, as he is coaching our middle school program and still doing great things for us now. But we don't ever, for lack of better terms, want to take away the focus from the teaching and learning inside the buildings. But that being said, art, music, dance, cheerleading, educational-based athletics, those things are nuggets to get our students to graduate. I'm very proud to say that our Seattle Public School standard for graduation rates and being eligible is higher than the, even the WIA standard. So with that being said, we use that as a vehicle and a nugget to move us and graduate our students. We need your support. And, and with the budget deficit that Dr. Nyland has been dealing with and you know, the school board, you know, Director Harris, Gary, uh, we need your support. So as Dick Lee comes up later on, please think about if there's a way that you can help our student athletes get to and from games. That would be very important to us. JG? The other, the other thing that we have is our unified sports program. Our unified sports program is students with and without intellectual disabilities. Uh, those are not the same students that play in our WIA programs. Uh, we have, we're in all, all the high schools, uh, about nine of the middle schools, seven of the elementaries, and we're also trying to get this program. We started and we've been doing well, but we had some challenges. When we first started the program six years ago, no one else in the state really had it. We were sponsored by the Seattle uh, Sounders and the Special Olympics of Washington. If you know anything about the Special Olympics of Washington, they're a volunteer-based organization. And so what was happening is our coaches were coming in, they were with their parents, and then they were uh, students, and then they were leaving as those kids moved on. Director Gary, our school board member, uh, is very instrumental in our SPED program, as is, as is Ms. Harris. She sat down with me and Tara Davis, who's over the Unified program, and I started telling her some of the challenges, and she asked me different questions. She didn't really say anything then. She came back about a week later, and her and her husband, Neil, wrote us a $25,000 check. Please give her a hand. So I was born at night, but not last night. I figured somebody gave me 25,000. The least I could do is let them have 30 seconds on the microphone. So director, would you say a little something, please? First, I wanna say congratulations to all the um, past uh, Hall of Famers and our, this year's inductees. Um, that's, it's truly impressive. And I, I wanna invite Tara up here with me while I speak because she's my partner in this. So uh, it really did happen that way in that I was asked, I was listening and I said, well, what do you need? And he said, I need money to support my coaches because these people volunteer but as we all know, when you volunteer, it takes a lot out of you. And you end up giving more, and you spend your own money. And we don't need that. We need these people to bring their hearts and souls, and we need them to not think about what their expenses are, but whether or not they can do this job and support our kids. Unified is a great program where it takes an, a, dis a student with disabilities and an able-bodied student, pairs them together for a common purpose. And it's a very collaborative, and wonderful opportunity for everybody to work together and acknowledge the strengths that all of our students bring. And that's the truth about athletics. We all know in this room that athletics has broken down barriers for people since time immemorial, right? I mean, that's how it works. And so I gave that money in hopes, in part, that it would raise um, awareness about this program and now I challenge all of you. That's all it is. I, I put this on the line. I go to work every day for free for the school board, as Director Harris and I know. But I'm still willing to give more. And I challenge all of you to think about what you can give more to. And we're hosting the Special Olympics this summer. And so there's going to be so many opportunities. It's going to be at the UW. And we, Seattle, need to put on our best face and show that we come out for our kids, no matter what somebody else wants to label them, because they are our kids, and they are our athletes, and we love them, and we support them, and every one of their victories is a victory for our whole city. So thank you. Congratulations to everybody. And did you want to say anything? 
about this. It's so important, and she's doing all the work, honestly. <laughs> Thank you, Director Gary. Um, part of the work and part of the challenge, too, is just getting people out. We've had our students age out of the program, and it's a unique experience when you can go and you see students with intellectual disabilities and students without. They come together in a unified way. It actually unifies the whole school. You have students who may not have recognized uh, a, a student with an intellectual disability, and now they're on the same team. And it really brings the school community together. And that's what we need. We need our students to have a sense of purpose and pride, not just for their school, but all students who attend schools. That's what we say here at Seattle Public Schools. Every student, every classroom, and every day. Well, how do we show it? And this is a great way to show it. So I'm, I'm very happy to be doing this work. I actually have an opportunity to coach one of the uh, all-female team in the 2018 Special Olympics. And I'm really excited and honored to do that. So whatever you can do, just think about if you could come out and support, if you can give to the cause, please do. Thank you. Thank you, TD and JG. That's Urban Vernacular for uh, that's Urban Vernacular for Tara Davis and Director Jill Gary. Moving on to something that we talked about uh, as a staff at Seattle Public Schools this year about an award, a merit award, Barb Tortis Merit Award. Uh, we've had many athletic directors come through here in 39 years, 139 years that have been outstanding. We've had the late Harvey Lang uh, Landum. You've had uh, the late uh, Frank Inslee. You've had Amy McWashington. Uh, you know, we've had some great ones. When you talk about Barb Tortoise, I consider her a friend. Uh, I met her probably about six years ago. And, uh, I, I, you know, she takes my calls. I, I work crazy hours. She takes it at 1 o'clock in the daytime, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I was whining about some issue that I was having. And she listened and let me talk. And at the end of the conversation, she said something very important. She said, Eric, if we didn't have challenges, we wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> so I hung the phone up and went to sleep. My point is, when you look at the history, and you please turn in your brochure and look at her history. I'm not going to uh, read it word for word. But these are the things that I will tell you about her. Number one, she's the first female uh, Seattle Public School District Athletic Director. She's the individual that ushered in Title IX, not just for Seattle Public Schools, but for the state of Washington. She's the only athletic director, and I'll try to give you a little history of how it works. Uh, if you're in higher education, you have the NCAA governing rules. For all high schools, it's called the NFHS, the, Nat the National Federation of High Schools. There's also an athletic, athletic director's association called the NIAAA. She's the only athletic director, male or female, in the state of Washington to be in both of their Hall of Fames. Um, she was here, she's the longest tenured Seattle Public School Athletic Director at 23 years, and she's just someone that I truly, truly admire. Last year, she couldn't make it because she was sick. She's retired in Arizona now. Uh, this year, she was having total knee reconstruction surgery. Uh, I wanted to put something on the screen. We tried to work with her, but, you know, the, the surgery didn't, things happened, and uh, she wasn't able to make it. But let me tell you, she's here in spirit. She's a great lady. Uh, I'm a big fan, and I don't think there's a better person to receive the award on her behalf than Coach Al Harrison. Coach Al Harrison is a former Seattle Supersonic, former University of Washington assistant coach, Garfield legendary basketball coach, O'Day basketball coach, and former Seattle University coach. Please welcome Coach Al. Barbara Tortoise Merit Award. Turn, open your program. You're going to hopefully go through a little bit with me here. Award was created in 2018 
to honor a community member of outstanding service and support of Seattle Public Schools and Seattle Public School Athletics. The person exemplifies integrity, leadership, sportsmanship, and community involvement that parallels the goals of Seattle Public Schools Athletics. So now a little bit about the Barbara Tortoise Merit Award 2018 recipient, Mr. Larry Gossett. So first a hand for Mr. Gossett, and then you're gonna have to bear with me as I read just a little bit about Mr. Gossett. King County Council Member Larry Gossett serves on the Metropolitan King County Council, representing many Seattle neighborhoods, including the Central Area, Capitol Hill, Beacon Hill, the Rainier Valley, Seward Park, UW, Fremont, Ravenna, Laurelhurst, pretty much all of everywhere, Skyway neighborhood in unincorporated King County. Larry Gossett grew up in West Seattle and Central Seattle and graduated from Franklin High School, but I do believe you spent a year at Garfield, so you, you have, we, we weren't quite sure what colors, I, I know, but Frank, green wore out, so we're good. After two years at the University of Washington, Gossett became a VISTA volunteer in Harlem and worked with poor youth and families. On his return to the UW, he was active in the Student Nonviolent non Coordinating Committee in 1967 and co-founded the University of Washington Student Union, UW-BSU, in 1968. Through the BSU, Gossett helped push UW to create Black Studies Program. He also helped organize nearly a, do a dozen high school and middle school black student unions throughout the city. Gossett fought to eliminate racial discrimination and increase the enrollment of African Americans and other students of color at the UW. After graduation, he became the first supervisor of the black student division in the Office of Minor Minority Affairs and helped found some of the key institutions for, pr for promoting and sustaining racial and economic diversity at the UW. Gossip developed a close relationship with activists for racial justice outside the black community, and along with Bernie White Bear, Bob Santos, Robert Masters, founded the Minority Executive Directors Coalition in 1982. Gossett served as the Executive Director of the Central Area Motivation Program, after which he was elected to the King County Council. Councilmember Gossett is extremely proud that in 1999, 13 years after the 1986 counties changed to honor Dr. Martha Luther King, he spearheaded the campaign to change the county logo and the image of Dr. King. In the summer of 2008, the University of Washington Alumni Association gave him the esteemed honor of being selected to one of the wondrous 100, one of the most influential UW graduates over the past 100 years. That's a pretty big deal. Larry Gossett is a highly respected community leader who has advocated for the underrepresented and underprivileged in King County for his entire career. He is an advocate for programs for, that help inner city youth and racial and class uh, discrepancies in our local criminal justice system. He has the ability to motivate and inspire people of all races and walks of life. He is dedicated to the cause of equal rights and economic freedom for all of our people. Much, much of which is obviously the goals of Seattle Public Schools. So it is my pleasure if you would please, Mr. Larry Gossett, come forward and receive your award. I told her I was not going to uh, forget that award. Uh, but when Eric first called me and said that I was going to get honored at this event where we honor our glorious and famed athletes, I was kind of nervous because the first time I met him, I said, yeah, I played sports in Seattle. And I played for two years at uh, Franklin High School and one year on the third team at Garfield. But while I was at Franklin, I became Franklin's first high school All-American basketball player. 
But wait, wait, I was stretching the truth a little bit. <laughs> so I was hopeful he wasn't going, he didn't run with that. I, I felt much better, though, when he said that uh, I was going to uh, be honored by being the first recipient of the Barbara Tortoise Merit Award. As he's already indicated, uh, she was a brilliant uh, leader in the Seattle Public Schools. She was the athletic director for 23 years. But she was also the first woman to ever become the uh, chairperson of the Washington Interscholastic Athletic Association. Then she became the first person ever in 1985 uh, to become the president of the National Interscholastic Athletic Association. And then finally, uh, in 1976, she spearheaded, she led the effort uh, for Seattle to finally allow uh, women under Title IX to play organized varsity sports. And I had a little partner then that was about 14, 15. She was happier than anybody I'd ever seen about this change. Her name, Joyce Walker, and she was going to the ninth grade at Garfield and she became an All-American. So Barbara, let's give it up one more time for Barbara Tortoise. <laughs> finally, finally, uh, I'd like to introduce to you all my lovely wife of 44 years. I'm gonna have to stop telling people I'm 58 years old. Uh, and our youngest, you can't see her, our youngest granddaughter, Sunny Rain, who we had to bring with us today. Uh, and lastly, I want to give a shout out to all the awardees and winners that are going to be inducted on this evening because this is a tremendous honor to be selected as one of Seattle's greatest. I've already indicated earlier, I wish I really were one of them. But y'all are, and we are highly appreciative of Mr. Lee and everybody else, Eric, that have been involved in building this wonderful program where we honor our top athletes who are also top people and leaders in our community each and every year. Thank you very much. All right, on with the rest of the evening. Nothing like a Hall of Fame event to make you feel like an underachiever. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to meeting Miss Tortoise someday, and congratulations, Council Member Gossett, well deserved. Um, and our, our next presenter is certainly no exception. For the first four awards, I want to invite to the podium Dr. Flip Herndon. Many of you may, may know Flip. I just had the pleasure of meeting him tonight. Uh, he's a native of Tacoma, ran track cross country in high school and college, attended Whitman College, Harvard University, and then decided he wasn't done and went on to Rutgers and the University of Washington. So certainly his academic pedigree speaks for itself. Uh, he's a 20-year career in education as a teacher and a building administrator, a central office administrator. I'm not sure what you haven't done, um, but uh, also been a coach. And on top of all that, he's been married for 20 years and the proud father of three boys, Dr. Herndon. Well, good evening. Not, a, not an easy act to follow with uh, such recognitions coming up, but I'll try and do my best. <clears throat> I'm happy to present uh, these next four awards. Um, the recipients aren't, aren't here tonight. Uh, two of them are, are posthumous, but uh, we'll go through and, and talk about the first one. Don Coriel, Lincoln High School, 1943. So Don uh, was a tennis player for the Lynx, the Lincoln Lynx, named the All-City Football Honorable Mention as a quarterback. He also played for the University of Washington and professionally San Diego State University head coach for 12 years and coached 14 seasons in the NFL with the San Diego Chargers and the St. Louis Cardinals. If many of you followed the NFL during that time, you may know his offense as the Air Coriel. So he was quite the coach. Um, many, many of his players uh, truly appreciated him as a coach and felt that they connected with him personally. Uh, that was what he was really known for on top of his winning ways. But um, you can see the, the other pieces in here. Uh, NFL Coach of the Year, 
1974, and AFC Coach of the Year in 1979, the first coach to win 100 games in college and professional football. So our first honoree for tonight, uh, Don Coriel. Let's give a round of applause. Our second honoree for tonight, uh, Mr. Sammy White, also from Lincoln High School, 1945. Uh, first two-time first team all-city catcher for the Lynx. First team all-city basketball center as a senior leading Lincoln to the state championship. Little fact, Sammy was actually born in Wenatchee, but we're glad that he came here and decided to pursue his high school career here in uh, Seattle. He declined to play professional baseball, even though he had offers to do so, and uh, decided to attend the University of Washington, playing for uh, leading as a hitter, as a sophomore and a junior, led Washington to its first NCAA basketball tournament in 1948 and selected to the All-West team in 1949 by the National Association of Basketball Coaches. Uh, once he finished at University of Washington, he declined some professional basketball, uh, a professional basketball offer from the Minneapolis Lakers, uh, played with the Pacific Coast League Seattle Rainiers for three years, and then an 11-year Major League Baseball career playing for the Boston Red Sox, Milwaukee Braves, and the Philadelphia Phillies. He's already been in, inducted into the state of Washington and, U and Husky Hall of Fame. And one last little factoid about him. In 1959, he ruined a no-hitter of Bob Feller. Uh, seventh inning, broke up that no-hitter and ruined that game for Mr. Feller. So uh, if we could honor Mr. Sammy White. So the first two were before my time in high school. The next two were after my time in high school. So uh, the first of our honorees, Corey Dillon. So Corey named uh, Parade Magazine's All-American and All-Metro running back. Named Metro League Player of the Year in 1992 an all-metro outfielder selected by the San Diego Padres in the 1993 draft. Earned the College Sports Magazine's Junior College Offensive Back of the Year Award. Played one season for the University of Washington. I remember watching him out on that field. A 10-year career with the Cincinnati Bengals and the New England Patriots, earning four bowl, Pro Bowl selections. He's also a member of the 10,000-yard rush club for the NFL. Currently ranked 20th in the NFL's all-time rushing list, named Seattle Times' top 25 greatest running backs in state history, and inducted into Dixie College Hall of Fame. Our third honoree for tonight, Corey Dillon. I forgot to mention that it was Franklin High School, class of 93, so I can't, can't forget the high school there. And our fourth honoree for tonight, a man still active in the NBA, which is why he's not here, Mr. Jamal Crawford, Rainier Beach, class of 99. He is, uh, was a two-time all-star basketball guard, led the Vikings to the 1998 state championship, named Parade Magazine's 1999 All-American, averaged 22.6 points per game as a senior, and back in the day, if I'm not mistaken, because I went to a couple of those too, that was when uh, Kingdom was hosting those games. I was way up high, way up high. Uh, in college, point guard for one season at the University of Michigan. And professionally, currently playing with the Minnesota Timberwolves after 18 seasons in the NBA. Three-time recipient of the NBA's Sixth Man of the Year Award, by the way, that's the first time in NBA history that's been done. Has scored 50 or more points in a game for three professional teams. Jersey number 23 has been retired by Rainier Beach. 
And Rainier Beach's basketball gym, Crawford Court, is named in his honor. Our fourth honoree for tonight, Jamal Crawford. Thank you, Flip. Um, please welcome to the stage our next presenter, a woman I just had the pleasure of, of meeting tonight and has some wonderful golf stories about playing at St. Andrews. And, um, but I, I know a significant leadership role in making this event and this Hall of Fame actually a reality. Dr. Singh has lived in North Seattle for almost 28 years. She's raised two boys, both of whom were student athletes at Ingram High School. She's been an avid, sometimes rabid, I'm told, a supporter and advocate for public education and the importance of athletics as well as educational activities as a part of young people's growth and development. She's a retired physician and now spends her time focusing on things that she is passionate about and bringing joy. She's on the board of the directors for the Puget Sound Komen as one of the founders of the Ingram High School Booster Athletic Club, which is an independent parent-run organization. And as I said, she's also one of the charter members of Seattle Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame Selection Committee, um, inducting the second class tonight, Dr. Singh. Thanks, Karen. So I must be the only person who has to lower the microphone. Um, so it truly is an honor to do the presentation for the award for Debbie Armstrong tonight. Um, this is an exciting night honoring the Olympic gold medal winner on the night after the, another American woman won the gold medal in the um, giant slalom uh, and is poised, obviously, to win many more mo uh, medals as, as the games um, proceed. In many ways, uh, Debbie paved the way for U.S. women's ski program that brought a new athleticism and aggressive approach to racing. Uh, that has resulted in the success of skiers like Julie Mancuso, Lindsey Vaughn, and now Michaela Schifrin. Debbie was born in Salem, Oregon, but fortunately for us, she grew up in Seattle. She was a multi-sport athlete at Garfield High School, and in addition to ski racing, she achieved varsity letters in tennis, volleyball, basketball, and soccer. She was a member of the Garfield High School girls basketball team that won the Metro Championship her freshman year, and the following year, they won the state championship. She also was uh, an MVP for the soccer team, and in 1980, she won the national junior title in giant slalom at Squaw Valley. While Debbie made the U.S. ski team in 1980, she actually catapulted to the international stage at the 1984 Olympics in Sarajevo, where she became the first American woman to win a gold medal in skiing since Barbara Cochran won the gold medal 12 years previously. Debbie's gold medal was the first in a string of medals won by American skiers at the 1984 Olympics, including Kristen Cooper, Phil and Steve Mayer, and Bill Johnson. By the way, all five of those uh, medalists um, came from the Northwest. After her retirement from competitive skiing in 1988 at the ripe old age of 24, uh, Debbie left the ski life behind and went and got her degree in history from the University of New Mexico. She's been involved in various humanitarian causes as well, including the Debbie Armstrong Say No to Alcohol and Drugs campaign, the Ski for All Foundation, which opens skiing events to the disabled, and the Global Relief, as in L-E-A-F, Sarajevo, which seeks to reforest Sarajevo after the Bosnian War. Today, Debbie serves as Alpine Competitive Program Director for the Steamboat Springs Winter Sports Club, a world-renowned ski club located in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, which is where she is tonight. Uh, she has helped develop more young talent, and the SSWSC has had many medalists in the past several Olympics. Debbie developed her racing skills in the 1970s at Alpental, um, up at Snoqualmie Pass, and the run Debbie's Gold and Armstrong Express High Speed Quad Chairlift are named in her honor. She was inducted into the U.S. National Ski and Snowboard Hall of Fame in 1984. While she lives in Steamboat Springs, we are still fortunate to have her parents reside here in Seattle, and she does visit several times a year, bringing her 10-year-old daughter, who is now also apparently hitting the ski slopes. Debbie couldn't be here tonight, and accepting the award on her behalf are her parents, Hugh and Dolly. 
Congratulations to Debbie on the 2008 class of athletes inducted into the Seattle Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame. Take a picture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Debbie, Debbie regrets that she can't be here. She's coaching ski racing in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and her kids need her. So she's still there. She asked me to tell you that she feels tremendously honored to have been named to this um, Hall of Fame in its second year. The world knows Deb as a skier, but she prefers to think of, uh, as her, herself as a multi-sport athlete. And certainly her sport, uh, sports career at Garfield reflects that. She made the Garfield women's varsity basketball team as a freshman and in subsequent years lettered in soccer, tennis, and volleyball. Um, her second year in high school, her basketball coach felt that she needed to choose between basketball and ski racing, and she chose ski racing. Uh, Deb was a senior at Garfield and. 81 when she won the Junior National Giant Slalom Championship and was named to the uh, U.S. ski team. Three years later and 34 years ago yesterday, she won the Olympic gold medal in Giant Slalom in Sarajevo. Deb treasures her experiences in Garfield's sports programs and credits them with teaching her how to win and even more importantly, how to lose without feeling like a failure. She truly wishes that she could be here with us all and enjoying this moment, but uh, she's having fun where she is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> As I said at the beginning, I had the pleasure of meeting Debbie. She sat courtside with me a few times at Storm Games and, and brought her daughter. I have, my daughter's nine, so our daughters got along famously as well. But I think in addition to her accomplishments, obviously not only at Garfield but on the slopes, she's a great example of how athletes, because of the impact sports has on us, we use it as a vehicle to give back. And Debbie is a huge example of giving back to not only a sport she loves, but to kids and a great example of paying it forward and, and just I'm sure one ex example of many of the inductees tonight who are doing exactly the same thing. Our next presenter is the cousin of our next inductee. Regina Lambert is a former basketball player at Chief South from, should I say the years, Regina? Do you want me to? <laughs> I'm not going to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, where she earned the name G Wiz for being the best defender and only sophomore to start for the Lady Seahawks in 1974. We're about the same age, and I remember that Chief Self program, um, a very formidable women's basketball program at the time. Her love for basketball was followed by her volunteering and coaching youth teams at the recreational level. She also has the honor of being the oldest returning alumni player to play in the alumni game. More power to you. <laughs> Um, but again, most probably, I'm proudly, I'm sure, the mother of two sons and the grandma of five, Regina Lambert. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, I have the honor and the privilege of being the cousin of the next recipient. And uh, her journey began when she was about maybe eight years old. Her stepfather put the basketball in her hands, and um, she never looked back from then. She would carry that basketball with her everywhere she went. She slept with the basketball. <laughs> basketball was her life. And from then, I had the honor and the privilege of becoming her first basketball coach. And boy, was that a ride. 
I mean, she was the player. She was the youngest on the team, and she played up because the other girls couldn't play at the ability that she could play at. And so I then later told her we were going to play next year, and the team just kind of fell apart. And so I had the honor and the privilege of passing her off to Jim Webster. Awesome, awesome man. He was just phenomenal in her life, not just because of basketball, but he, he made sure that she knew how important her education was in her life. And from then, she went on to Chief South High School, my good old alma mater, and she got the privilege of being under the tutelage of Carmen Martinez. And she did a good job with her there. And then later on, she went into the college field, and she played with the Lady Bears. And I had the opportunity of being with her on some of her college recruits. And one of the best ones we went to was uh, Georgia. And she got to meet her favorite female basketball player, Saudia Roundtree. And if you ever get a chance, watch Saudia Roundtree's videos. And you will definitely see Sheila Lambert in those videos. Amen. You know, and I just want to tell her how much I love her and I appreciate her. And she's, you know, like my daughter. And I just love her so much. And then she went on to be in that professional basketball. And I just want to thank you. And I just want to introduce you to 31 flavors of <laughs> Sheila Lambert. So I'm not very good at public speaking, so if my voice starts to shake, just bear with me. Um, I'm grateful to be honored with such great athletes. First off, first off, I want to thank everybody at my table for coming out and sharing this moment with me. Each and every one of you has been instrumental in my life through the good times and bad. You always stood by my side <clears throat> and helped weather the storm. You are all a big part of why I am this fabulous woman standing here today. Thank you. I grew up playing basketball with the fellas in my neighborhood, uh, West Seattle, the old high point to be exact. I used to get roughed up, scuffed up, and all the above. I would go home and sometimes cry, but that didn't stop my grind. I'll be right back out there the next day trying to figure out ways to maneuver around the court. I got stronger mentally and physically, but that didn't stop the bumps and bruises and sometimes even fist fights. I figured it was because I was the only girl out there playing and don't no boy want to get beat by no girl, <laughs> especially in front of their friends. Each day that passed, they got rougher and tougher. I got smarter, fearless, and relentless. I got older and all the guys I grew up playing with are still around, representing, cheering, and rooting me on. I then realized the reason why they put me through all that wasn't because I was a girl, but because I was actually pretty good. <laughs> I want to thank all my fellas for all the great memories and all the battle wounds. I developed a little thing called grit. It molded me into a player that now is being inducted into our second Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, she's by demand. I was going to say, Sheila, you're actually wrong. You're a great public speaker. Yeah. 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 Uh, I know I know Sheila a little bit um, and know a little bit about her story and she's she's a great example of how you know basketball not only helped raise her but it, it really shaped her Carmen I didn't realize you were here I didn't get to say hello Kathy my goodness a table of coaches Sandy and Kavan from Lakeside Joe um, 
your your table in a, is an example of it, you know it it takes a village and I, I know all of you coaches really pretty well and and um, had the pleasure of coaching I shouldn't say pleasure of coaching against Sheila but I was also involved in the magic program and and knew Jim well and rest in peace coach Webster but but it takes a village and you know coaches I'm sure many of us are uh, what an opportunity to give back to to young people and especially women so kudos to all the coaches who have impacted all these athletes in so many profound ways um, okay Mr. Lee I think you're back up for the next inductee Al went and had his eyes dilated today, and so reading the program was not an option. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Al. So it is my privilege to please turn to your program so I can talk just a little bit about Mr. Carl Irvin. High school, named two-time All-State, All-Metro first team point guard, led Cleveland to two back-to-back -back state championships. Eagles 76 squad voted team of the 20th century by coaches and sports writers and named the finest prep basketball team in state history by the Seattle Times. In college, he's four-year starter for Seattle University, named all-conference and team captain senior year, ranked one of the Red Hawks' all-time assist leaders. <clears throat> Professional, drafted by the Seattle Supersonics in 1980, played two seasons with the Alberta Dusters of the Continental Basketball Association, the CBA. Other, he was an assistant basketball coach at Seattle University for 10 years, and he was inducted into the Seattle University Hall of Fame. I know personally um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Bill Maynard was principal uh, at Cleveland High School at the time, I think when the Fab Three were playing there, and Bill would really like to have been here tonight, but he, uh, he uh, sends his best. He also sent a little money along, so I want to thank him for that. But to accept the award on uh, the behalf of the family is Mr. Bill Ellaby. So if you would please come forward. Four minutes, so hey, <laughs> you went before, you didn't go, it's our turn. We're gonna go, we're gonna, we're gonna do it right. <laughs> well, um, before Bill starts to speak, I just want to say that um, I know my dad would have been so grateful to um, accept this award, <laughs> and um, I think it's great that all these people are being honored for the legacies that they've left behind. I want to first uh, thank God. I want to first. Um, I want to first thank God, uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Through Him, all things are possible. Um, Carl, we were raised in a family. Went to church. Went to Mount Zion, and we took God very seriously. And it's just a blessing tonight to be here to represent Carl. On behalf of my late uncle Carl Irvin, it's an honor and privilege to accept this great recognition by the Seattle Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame. For my family in attendance, Carl's lovely wife, Penny Irvin, his beautiful daughter, Carly Irvin, his loving sisters, Yvonne Carr, Sarah J. E. Dean Irvin, Edda Walters, Charlene Franklin, brothers Charles Irvin Jr. in attendance, his lovely wife, Beverly Irvin, Dr. Shalon Irvin, Zach Graves, Mr. Thomas Costello, and also my son, Kobe, and Chancellor and my wife, Elizabeth Ellaby. Thanks for coming. It means a lot that you're here to celebrate Carl Irvin. We would like to sincerely take the thank that Seattle Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame for this honor. Our family is overcome with emotion and have so much gratitude to the Athletic Hall of Fame Committee for this honor. Mr. McGurdy, you know what you've done for me personally and I really appreciate what you're doing for these kids and for my family, giving Carl this honor. 
but this is the pinnacle award for Carl. Carl loved the Metro League in Cleveland High School. He coached in the Metro League as well with Coach Al Harrison and jo Jojo Buchanan and Steve Hawes. They were called the Dream Team. Carl really enjoyed those times. As a child, I spent many days and nights living with Carl at Graham's house on Beacon Hill. I tagged behind Carl and mimicked everything he did. He had the greatest jump shot I ever seen and the greatest court vision. His nickname was Court Wizard, something I put in the back of my jersey when I played at Garfield High School. Me and Carl would often watch basketball all day long, and he would break down all the statistics of all the players, the coaches, and even the referees. He was a basketball encyclopedia. Carl had a Georgia White poster on his wall. That's who he played for. That was, his, that was his favorite player, number 10. Carl was selected to the Team of the Century. I couldn't be up here if I didn't talk about Team of the Century because there's two guys here, Jojo Rodriguez and Coach Al Harrison, my coaches at Garfield, who said they were the best. <laughs> well, first start for their point that, yes, they did beat Carl as a sophomore in 1974. They, they went out to a 25-0 run and ended up beating them 80-35. But that lesson taught Carl to be tougher and a better player. So as you see, for the next two years, they won two state championships and had one loss. Carl's best friend, Silk, Keith Harrell, Garfield Superdog, best player. Let her, let her play with Carl Seattle U before becoming a world-renowned motivational speaker. Carl would often say that Keith Harrell and Clint Richardson, O'Day High School, 33 points a game were the best players of his time. Keith, Carl, Clint, and Juwan would all play together at Seattle University. They all wanted to play with Carl. He was unselfish, a great player, but he was a better person. He had the greatest attitude. Carl brought all his friends together with laughter, food, and fun. We would be at Carl's, we would be at Graham's house all day playing basketball. In the summer before Carl's senior year, Carl played with a guy by the name of Steve Madsen. They played in the summer all-star team that went, to, that went to Cincinnati. Carl, Juwan, Odom, James Woods, they all played for the national championship in Cincinnati. They lost to Albert King of Menard King of New York City. They took second place, both for future NBA players. How could I be up here while talking about Carl's team, the 75 team, the 76 team? We talked about Carl and James Woods and Jawan Odom and even Eli Carter, all Division I players. But there were other guys as well, like Brad Bowser and John Bell, Danny Horn, Carl's best friends, Phil Petty, Buddy Williams, Keith Laurie, and my favorite, Robert Keller. Other guys were James Carter, Tony Carter, Maurice Young, Jesse Gardner, Gary Bowman, Tom Kier. Carl's mom, my Graham, she called these guys the Blue Bandits, the reserves. They played a big part in Cleveland's two dream team seasons, pushing the starters into practice and making them a better team. Often practice were tougher than the games. I would watch them guys as a kid. They would literally, they would literally fight to win the basketball game. I would, I would ask Carl to give me a shiner as well, but Jawan Odom beat him to it. Graham would often make spaghetti and sweet potato pie, and Carl and the boys would eat it all day long. Graham, Betty Woods, they would sometimes argue who had the best food, but Carl would always say Graham won, and James would say no, and they would start wrestling in the backyard. Carl was loved by everybody. He was such a great guy. Everybody used to come by the house. The games were the, games were the best I ever seen. I had front row seats, and I was blessed. Guys like Jojo Rodriguez, Lavelle Staniford, Leon Johnson, Clarence Ramsey, James Edwards, Kim Stewart, Mike Bathia, it really didn't matter, Wayne Floyd, David Barton, and many others. When they weren't playing basketball, they were doing other things, as you would know. <laughs> they would meet at Graham's house, eight or 10 of them, and they would jump in Juwan's Ford 
Fur Line, where they were getting Carl's 1973 Chevy Impala with the white vinyl top. They would head out of town to Lewis and Clark Drive-In, and I would beg to come with them. If Carl was here today, he would thank his favorite coach, Coach Frank Ahern. He was the best coach in, the, in, in, in Metro history sports. Let's give Coach a hand. <laughs> coach Aaron was a stickler for fundamentals and would drill Carl and the boys for hours at a time. He was a PE teacher at Asa Mercer, where they, where they went 88 and 1, with Coach Mel Williams and Jim Taylor. Coach Ahern took me under his wing as well at Garfield. I think he and Coach Al took a special interest in me. Because of Carl, I was blessed, and I was determined not to let them down. Carl had another coach, too, named Mr. Fred Harrison, a great man. He played at Rainier Beach High School, was a center in 1974. He ended up being a role player in college, went to Highline, went to Montana State. But he was a great man, and he understood basketball from a different perspective, since he wasn't a star. He was able to mold a team together, and they, able, and they played together hard for two years. Carl always felt he was the reason why he got the job at Highline. Carl felt that him and the boys played for him and would do anything for him. <laughs> Last thing I want to talk about, because he must be walking towards me, <laughs> is the shot. The shot. The shot became Carl's highlight. The play defined his poise and cemented his legacy in, in high school basketball for Washington State. They had played, they were playing Lincoln and Tacoma. Well, Lincoln and Tacoma had beat them the first time. And um, Carl, that was the only loss in his career. So they played him the uh, second game of the season. So Carl had a chance to play him again. And um, he had, a, they had a seven seconds left on the clock and they were down by one point. And they had a play that Carl called, and he, read, and he had his fist up. And that was a play that Eli Carr would come to the pick for the pick and roll on the right side. And um, he set the pick. Carl came, and he made the shot. Carl said, quote, I knew it was going in. I couldn't really believe it. You know what I'm saying? But I just knew it was going in. I'm not shocked. When Carl made the shot, in the Seattle Coliseum with 12,000 fans screaming. Everybody was jumping up and down. I looked at my Aunt Sarah, who took me to a lot of games as a kid at Cleveland, and I said, what's the big deal? I've seen Carl make that shot a thousand times. <laughs> to Carl's daughter, Carly, to my son, Kobe, if Carl was here, he'd tell you guys it'd be great. He would tell you to believe like he believed in his last shot. He would tell you that you can do anything if you decide to put your heart and mind to it. If Carl was here, he would tell his family that he loves you guys for everything you've done for him. He would tell his wife, Penny, he loves you and thanks for being strong. He would tell his brother, Charles, I'm still mad at you <laughs> because you put that bee in my room and you knew I was allergic. <laughs> to the committee, once again, thank you. To Coach Al Harrison, Coach Jojo Rodriguez, thank you. I love you guys. Our family will preach this for the rest of my life. Thank you. Very thoughtful tribute to your Uncle Bill. I'm sure that wasn't easy, and I think we're all clearly, though we didn't know, many of us didn't know Carl, were extremely touched by your family's loss. Um, our next honoree will be introduced by one of his former high school coaches. Dave Belmont is a retired teacher, Metro basketball coach since 1971, head coach at Franklin High School for 16 years, 1983 coach of the year, assistant coach at Garfield, and currently at Rainier Beach, where they have won, obviously, multiple state championships. Coach Dave Belmont. Uh, 
Actually, it's Bill Monty. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, to you Mario Bailey, obviously. I met him 32 years ago. And he was a young sophomore at Franklin High School. And I, obviously, uh, someone that somebody, a lot of people have been talking about, very talented. Uh, that was in 1986. Two years later, he led Franklin High School to the basketball championship and the football championship, and he was also all city in both sports, which is unusual to say the least. At that time, as all of you know, he was heavily recruited to University of Washington. An interesting story I could tell you because coaches oftentimes list their players a little bigger than they should be. Uh, the UW coach, the famed UW coach, asked me point blank, was he as tall as I was listening him? And I said, if you take everything into consideration, his hands, his speed, his intelligence, he's probably around six feet tall. <laughs> Two years later, that famed coach said, Belmonte, you're wrong. He's about 6'2". <laughs> well, three years after 1988 at, at Franklin, he led the Huskies to a championship, a national championship. He was also an All-American. And I think all of you can remember one of his famous pitchers at Heisman stance in the end zone, which is well represented in Sports Illustrated. Then he went on and played in every league that had an L in it, the NFL, the CFL, the AFL, the XFL, and he also played in the NFL in Europe, where he became very famous in Germany. After he finally finished all of that L business, he came home and did something special, finished his degree, something his mother wanted him to do. And then he did something else special. He helped Franklin football at the time when it really needed it and coached them for a while, brought them back to life. So the awards, the trophies, everything that he's received are me memorable. What do I remember him about? I remember him helping his teammates, the football players who were struggling in school, and he helped them. The basketball players who didn't play that much, and he encouraged them. The coaches who weren't that good, and he helped them. He's, he's really a, a special person, and I can tell you that he's, he made it because he was, had a little bit of talent. He had a little bit of coaching, but the main reason he made it is he has a terrific mother. And his mother is a reason that he made it, and she is really should be awarded tonight more than Mario. <laughs> so, so I present you Mario Bailey, produced and coached by Margaret. And he took my speech. <laughs> Half the stuff he said I was about to say. Um, first, I don't think you should give these speakers wine before you get up here and talk. <laughs> that hasn't happened before. But I'd first like to thank my coach. I was able to call him. I left high school in 88, but I was able just to call him real fast once, once I heard about it. And, and he said yes. For you to be able to call your high school basketball coach 30 years later, and he's right on the spot. To top it off, he's a coach right now at Rainier Beach, and he left at halftime, and they were winning, and they end up losing. So he has to have a special love for me to leave his team at halftime. So thank you, Coach. It's greatly appreciated. 
Man, I had my basketball coach introduce me because I wanted to dispel this football thing. I'm a basketball player, you know. You know, I, I grew up playing basketball all my life. Um, one of the highlights of my life is actually beating the legendary coach Al Hairston and my cousin Jojo Rodriguez and my rival Billy Ellaby my last time in the doghouse. I still talk about it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I left. I left 1988 as Metro champs in basketball. That's what I. That's what I'm proud of. They had it wrong. They said I was second team. The only thing I wanted them to change was no, I'm first team basketball. Let's get that, get that straight. But I'm here tonight, kind of like what what Mr. Belmonte said. I'm here just specifically just off my uh, support system. At my table, I have my sister, who is really my cousin, but she was raised as my sister. She's two months younger than me, but she's so that makes her baby sister forever. But she's always had my back. She's always supported me, even when I was wrong. She's going to tell you I'm right in public and then come to me in, in, in private and be like, what's wrong with you? But that's what a real sister's supposed to do. My auntie, she's like a second mother to me. I was pretty much raised by all women. She took good care of me and, and took some of the heat off me when my mom was really seriously on me. So she's. Thank you, Auntie. It's greatly appreciated. My big brother is here. I, I was recently inducted to the UW Hall of Fame a few years ago, and he wasn't there. But I was raised, I'm the baby, and I guess I'll be the baby forever. I was raised as a guy that would never play football, wasn't tough enough. I'm that, that guy. But my brother mercil mercilessly tortured me, beat me up, but he never let anybody else beat me up. Only he could beat me up. He taught me how to tie my shoe. He let me play basketball. I always wanted to do the hook shot. He let me get my hook shot. He let me get my banker. He taught me how to do most of everything that a man's supposed to teach you. So I can't go without thanking my big brother, William. I don't know where he, there he is, there he is. <laughs> and last but not least, what Mr. Bomani said, you know, these awards are nice and it's greatly appreciated. I definitely appreciate that I can be this old, I won't say how old I am, but that I'm this old because I appreciate it even more. Had it been 10 years ago, I might not appreciate it. So um, thank you. But I feel like it's specifically for my mother. My life is to, ma to make her proud. And Mr. Bomani was right. At one time, I felt like I had played in 100 football games and 100 basketball games, and she had been to 99 of them. And she was like the team mom. She was. Uh, with Mr. Bomani, they're still friends, they still can talk. She was with my football coach. You know, the lessons that she taught me, you know, from giving, making me bring a progress report home. And <coughs> one day I brought the progress, re home, progress report home with two Ds. And she's like, well, you know you're not gonna play this week. <laughs> like, what do you mean I'm not gonna play this week? You, you can't have these grades in, in, in this house and, and play. She's like, but, I'm going to go to the game. Um, <laughs> you can let me know if you want to go to the game or not. And I'm in tears now. I'm like, no, I'm not going to the game. So she went to the game. My team blew them out. She came home and told me how good my team did without me. <laughs> and we never had that problem again. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. I'm forever a mama's boy, and I, I can't thank her enough. You know, I don't want to get up here and cry, but she is everything to me. And like I said, I live my life to make her proud. Um, if you ask what I'm doing now, I, I have to tell you that. I actually work for King County. I help 16 to 24-year-olds get back in school if you have dropped out. So if you have anybody that's struggling and needs to get back in school, you can let me know. I also... I also help them with employment. So if you have somebody 16 to 24 that you know needs a job, get in touch with me and I'll help them get a job. I have a foundation in which we feed the homeless for Thanksgiving the past five years. We sponsor um, families on Christmas. We give scholarships out um, to those that can't afford scholarships. And last but not least, so I can tell you if anybody's looking to buy a house or sell a house, I work for, <laughs> <laughs> I, I work for Keller Williams. You, you you can't come up to these events, give me some wine, and not let me sell myself up here. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, a shout out to Terry Metcalf, Quaker in the house. Uh, Bill Wright, Quaker in the house. 
Corey Dillon, Quakers. Yeah, we represent well in here. It's the Quakers, Quakers night. I have to do that. You know, that's just how it is. But an extra special shout out to Jamal Crawford. I've never seen somebody give so much back to the community, and that's what it's all about. Thank you. Next presenter is Pastor Carter, who's a native of Seattle, attended Garfield High School, class of 1966. Pastor Carter is a senior pastor of Eternity Mysteries in Seattle, married to Margaret Carter for 37 years, proud father of three sons, nine grandchildren, uh, retired from the city of Seattle, where he served as construction manager for Seattle Public Utilities. Currently in full-time ministry, his favorite pastimes are camping, salmon fishing, walking sports, of course, and is a dear, dear friend of our next inductee. Well, thank you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Uh, first, giving honor to God, who is the head of my life as well. Uh, I'd like to um, thank SPS, and uh, I'd like to congratulate all the inductees uh, on tonight, and this is an awesome event, and this is a privilege I want to thank you, Bill, for allowing me to stand in the gap to be here to introduce you. I also want to recognize uh, Councilman Gossett and Councilman uh, um, uh, Harold on tonight. Uh, and it's uh, good to see them here because I see them quite everywhere, uh, a lot of places, and so do you all. But uh, I just wanted to say, um, it's an honor for Bill to be recognized. He's been recognized all of them down the coast, and uh, he lived a majority of his life in California, and uh, he's back home. I think he's been home for some time. I'll let him tell you how long he's been home, but he, uh, it, it means a lot to be recognized at home. Uh, 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 this... Uh, setting in here, this environment in here is family. This environment in here is community. Uh, and so uh, we all feel a part of it as Mario was speaking and giving shout outs. You know, I could give a shout out to a lot of bulldogs and, <laughs> and that rival goes back, you know, but, uh, uh, but Bill, um, he started, I've been knowing Bill North for uh, 60 years. Yeah, 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 60 years, and we were, uh, I'm not going to tell you all my age, but uh, he, uh, uh, we started playing down sports in Seattle, and Seattle was uh, the central area, and we would play in Washington Park and play in Garfield Park and play over Meany and play over at Broadway and play over at Yesler Terrace and play up at the Boys Club. And when you uh, were involved like that, you needed uh, a road dog. <laughs> you needed somebody to watch your back. Come on, somebody. And, 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 some, and you needed to watch somebody. So he was my friend. And I didn't really know what a friend was then. It was just a, 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 a having a lot of fun. We go to Husky games after uh, playing our Little League games. His coach was... Uh, the late Booth Gardner. I believe that was one of Bill's favorite coaches, uh, uh, along with many others. Uh, and his other mentors was his brothers, who were some awesome athletes, Woodson and Butch, Richard. And um, so we played all the way up into high school, and uh, we started getting serious about athletics, but Bill had this this instinct about him where he was tenacious. He was, he was about winning. And he had this drive uh, like you wouldn't see before. Um, and so um, he played at uh, Garfield High School and went on to Central Washington. And uh, we went on to Central Washington and he had an awesome coach there by the name of Gary Frederick. Uh, a coach is one thing, but a coach that can be a father figure is something else. And uh, Coach Frederick and Bill uh, get along 
and they communicate right now today. Uh, Bill was first uh, NAIA uh, in, uh, at Central Washington uh, for the uh, inter intercollegiate athletics uh, for American in baseball as a junior. He was selected by the C Chicago Cubs in 1969. And uh, that's only three years out of high school. And uh, they looked at him as all American. And he was kind of an unsung hero at the time. But uh, Bill was traded from the Chicago Cubs and he went on to start his career out on the West Coast as a Oakland A. And in that time, as being an Oakland A's center fielder, uh, Bill had the opportunity to participate in two World Series and be a part of three. Now, let me say that again. He has two World Series rings. His dad has one of them. He has one. And they were winners. Thank you, Woodson. And they, he was uh, on a team that played for three, had three. And that's an awesome accomplishment. Uh, he went on to play with the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants. He was the first uh, player when he was with Oakland to be a designated hitter. For some of you that can go back and remember when designated hitter and even designated running came in. And speaking of running, Bill uh, was American League base running leader, uh, champion for uh, two seasons. Uh, he went head to head with Lou Brock and then uh, uh, Ricky Henderson and names such as that. And so um, he was uh, a two-time uh, um, World Series. Um, he he, he in, indicated that in those World Series, he was uh, uh, a, um, award winner, uh, recipients of some of the uh, uh, plaques after the uh, the game. So uh, Bill was a very generous person all throughout all of his athletic career. He's always stayed in touch with his community. He's one of the biggest givers uh, that I've known. Uh, I've been around the uh, athletic uh, field for a while. But um, last and least, I'd like to say that Bill loves kids. He loves children. And, and a lot of the, the athletes do, but I just happen to personally be able to see him reaching out uh, right now, working with CAYA and working with the YMCA and um, also um, just uh, doing batting instructions with a lot of the young people. And he just spends his time with those young people. And so uh, I'm not gonna take up any more of his time. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to present to some and uh, introduce to others, uh, William A. North, better known as Bill North. Well, okay. What's that? Oh, this one? Mom, look at us now. My mom passed away, 97 years old. And she was, boy, I'll tell you. I don't know how many of you know Frances North, but she was my mom. She was mom to a lot of y'all, too. <laughs> you know, and mama, mama, I got to tell you guys, I, as an individual, I praise the Lord, he's measured every step I've ever taken, and he's brought me right here, right now, to tell you guys, thank you. I'm so honored and humble, there's something special when you're honored where you played in the dirt. 
I played in dirt all my life, yo. Broadway Park, all in parks, and, and I wasn't very good. When I was 18, I got hit in the eye with a baseball. I played my professional career blind in one eye and never told them. And then they made me a switch here, putting my bad eye out in front. But I dazzled them with my footwork. <laughs> but my life has been so wonderful. Uh, my epitaph's going to read three things. He knew the Lord. Number two, he had more than his share of people that loved him. And he had a good time. And you know what? I look at people here. Dave, where'd you go? Belmonte. We go back a long way, <laughs> you know. But I look at Larry, and I, I mean, I, and Dr. Mitchell and Terry, and you know, that was our village. That was our village, and we were all taken care of by our village. And I got to tell you. See, I was homeless. I wasn't very good <laughs> when I was coming up. I got hit the eye with that baseball and went crazy <laughs> because I wasn't supposed to play anymore. I couldn't catch the ball below my waist. And I ended up being a first-team All-American, hitting 476 my junior year with an on-base percentage of about 650, And I was supposed to be one of the five picks top five picks in the country till they found out I had a white girlfriend and was president of the Black Student Union. I got drafted in the 12th round. The 243rd player picked, and I was in the big leagues in two and a half years, like one of those first five picks would have been. And you know what? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I ain't mad at nobody, and I ain't got no evil in my heart. I just want to tell you guys, from the bottom of my heart, I am thoroughly thankful and humbled to be recognized in my own town by my people. <laughs> Hold up. <laughs> I got two things to tell you, though. When I was 10 years old, the Yankees and the Braves were playing in the World Series. That was Hank Aaron and Mickey Mount. Them was my guys. And I said, I want to play in the World Series. Now, tell me about the Lord. Now, I got to tell you something. I wouldn't have been anything in life. There's a bunch of you that I can hand that out to. But I got family over there. And they talk about brothers. My brothers used to get up in the morning, eat cornflakes, and kick me in my butt. <laughs> okay, that made me tell. But I got my family over there and my friends. And I just want to tell you guys, honestly, I thank you for every moment that you've given me, and I wouldn't be anything without you. And you all had a part in my success. And I appreciate you. And. <laughs> And to the rest of you, as Pastor Carter mentioned, kids, that saying, it takes a village to raise a child, also has a second phase to it. It says if the village doesn't raise the child, the child will grow up and come back and burn the village down. Think about that. We have an opportunity to do for kids. And I believe uh, early childhood development, childhood adversity uh, are very important to me. But I believe every child deserves a chance. And if you get a chance, rub a, rub a kid's head other than your own and tell him you love him. Thank you very much.
So we are so excited for this event. But I'm going to give you something for free with no charge. Uh, the people that are announcing the inductees, we need to move a little bit quicker, else the whack is going to start charging me money. <laughs> so I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying this is a great event, but, but it's dragging on just a little bit, and the inductees people are going on. I want to make sure that the people that have a chance to speak need to speak, but we need to move on. So let me get out of the way and start, and let me start the process for everybody else. So thank you. Along those lines, he needs no introduction. John Buller came from Omaha, Nebraska to play for UW. He was a teammate of the next inductee. John is very involved in our community, currently the executive director of the 101 Club, which supports this event. He's also a member of the Hall of Fame Selection Committee and was also, probably most notably for this group, was highly involved in bringing Eric McCurdy to Seattle Public School of Athletics. John. Thank you. It is a pleasure to uh, induct a friend. And uh, George Irvin uh, was truly a friend. I'll give a couple of really quick stories, but you gotta remember, I don't think the, he led the city two years, all city, uh, leading score at the UW, still number seven on the scoring list. Basically uh, went in to play ABA ball, Julie Serving, ended up for 25 years being a general manager and a coach for pro basketball. Came back here about four or five years ago and uh, what a pleasure it was to spend some time with him. Uh, he passed last year, and it's a sad story for all of us. But I've got to tell you just a couple of quick things that I think indicate, uh, kind of talk about uh, George. As a uh, end of my freshman year, we've had freshman ball, and um, the coach asked me to go pick this kid up from Bell, uh, Ballard. Said, and I think I got it because I had a car. So I picked up George to take him to this weekend visit to the University of Washington. And, you know, as that goes, you walk around campus and you look at things, and it would usually the biggest deal was you had a pickup basketball game with the players that were in, on scholarship and then these recruits. And that's when I learned that George was incredibly competitive and a really good shooter. He could shoot a basketball as well as anybody I've ever seen. In fact, one of the things that is not on your, your, your statement is that George still owns the percentage rule, most uh, highest percent of making – Shots and remember, there was no three-point line and no dumping. Uh, dunk, dumping. That's cool. <laughs> dumping. I think it's called, you know, hitting the dunking. I think is the right word. Anyway, George. George only shot shots between 12 feet and 18 feet. He didn't have a three-point line. And he's still number seven in the all-time scoring list. And I watched a game where he went 12 for 12. So it was an amazing thing to watch. But what was really funny is how competitive he was and how he kept that game in, in charge. So if he had had final, if a three-point line, I'm sure he would be in much, his point total would have been amazing. The last story I'll tell you is that a number, a couple years ago, Steve Haas and I went out to play golf with George. Um, he, had a, he lived on the other side of the, of the water and basically we drove over and I tell you, his competitiveness still is around and hitting a golf ball became kind of like a shot. So he really was enjoying the fact that myself and Steve Haas were looking really stupid playing golf. <laughs> With that, it's a pleasure to bring up his son, Jamie, who's going to accept the award for George Irvin. First off, Mario, I don't know where you are, but you weren't kidding about that wine. Um, I'm so thankful to accept this award on my dad's behalf. Uh, I would tell you right now how honored he would be uh, to be able to, to receive this award. And I think my family can attest, uh, we would have heard about it over and over and over again, how he's inducted to the Seattle Public School Hall of Fame. Um, while my dad went on to have a, a great career, that John talked about uh, in college and in the pros and playing and coaching in the NBA. When he talked about playing in high school, he had a little twinkle in his eye. It was very special to him. Um, it, you know, he really loved playing high school basketball in the city of Seattle. Uh, just last year, you know, and we're talking 50 years after his playing days in high school, he could still tell me what the scouting report was on this small forward from Roosevelt High School or 
how many points a game you scored his junior year in high school or you know that game winning shot or whatever that may be and and come to think of it uh, he didn't talk about his defense or his passing or <laughs> so as john's point he was he was quite the black hole um, you know uh you know i think it was a, a couple years ago he got inducted to the uh, the ballard hall of fame um, and his actual old coach coach goldskin showed up who is well into his 90 years, uh, 90 years of age. And I got a chance to meet him. And, uh, you know, they were still friends to this day and, and had such an impact on his life. And I think, you know, even, uh, even at the same time, you know, over the years, I've gotten to meet his old high school teammates. Uh, and, and, you know, he used to tell stories about how when he was a freshman, uh, some of the older guys would take him underneath his wing and really mentored him, right? And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that, that he always reflected on that is how much of an impact it had on his life and, and what it did from a mentorship perspective on, on, on him becoming the man that he was. Um, so I think, you know, from a, from a high school perspective, uh, it was something that he was uh, truly blessed to, to play basketball here. Um, and I can't thank you enough uh, for this honor. And I think if he was standing here today, uh, he would be very... Uh, uh, humbled by the other recipients uh, in the room and, and how tremendous, not only just athletes they are, but tremendous people. So on that note, thank you guys. All right, our next presenter is Bishop Willie McLean, Senior Pastor of Holy Temple Evangelistic Center in Seattle. Thank you for having me on this evening. I was honored and a privilege to be before you to introduce the next inductee. Uh, for the sake of time, the accomplishments are right in the program, so if you'd like to read those. But I would like to pick it up after football. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I've been knowing uh, Terry for over 50 years. And uh, we were in the community together growing up as young athletes. Uh, many times I would be in my chair and watch him play. He would bring me out of my chair because of his side-to-side -side moves and dipsy doodles and spins that would just amaze everyone. He has been not only a, a student of the game, but he's been an es expert in his professional field. He also has committed the same dedication and commitment uh, in the last 25 years in teaching uh, five-year-olds, amen, and he has been known as the kindergarten cop. I've worked with him in those 25 years, and we have been side by side. In the last 12 years, we've been in ministry together. He's still currently making moves, but they're making moves up and down I-5, going from Seattle to Everett, teaching that great uh, uh, Trinity um, Academy still teaching five-year-olds. So his commitment and dedication is way beyond, uh, I say, that of a normal man, because we all, if you ever had five-year-olds, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, you send them to school and let somebody else. And he has been that somebody else. He's currently now uh, in ministry with myself, and we've been side-by-side, uh, -side and. He's a great man of God, a great gospel preacher. He's also the associate pastor of Holy Temple Evangelistic Center. I'd like to introduce to you uh, this inductee, Reverend Dr. Terrence Metcalf. First of all, I want to say thank you to my Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ and who is first in my life. If it had not been for him in my life, I would not be standing here today. No matter what I accomplished on the football field or in track, 
it was because of his mercy and because of his grace that I was able to accomplish those things. Um, it was a, as I look back, Seattle Public Schools athletics was the start of something big in my life. Actually, I had a coach, Owell Mitchell, who has passed on, that in my senior year, because I didn't have my paperwork in all time, he told me to put the football down, and he told me I was never going to be nothing because I had a bad attitude and I was too little. <laughs> but what, he, what I think he knew what he was doing, he was motivating me. He saw that I was a fighter. And if you tell me I couldn't, I'm going to show you I can. And it was so funny, some 10 years later, I had to speak on his behalf. And I was waiting for the time to tell him, look at me now. <laughs> but when I got up to speak, it came, it came over me that it was because of him. He was one of the ones that pushed me, that saw something in me that graded I couldn't even see in myself. It was mentioned tonight. Frank Ahern, he told me when I was in the 10th grade that he was going to see me on TV. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just trying to make varsity. Um, but there's been many people in my life that caused me to excel. And a lot of those people were the ones that had negative thoughts about me. Because, see, like I say, I'm a fighter. I drive, I fight that traffic, uh, excuse me, every morning. 20 miles to teach a handful of kids that they're going to be somebody. That's my passion. That's what I get up for now. If you ask me how many games I've watched this year, I can tell you none. Because that does not excite me anymore. What excites me is what I can see a child come in with his head hanging low. And at the end of the year, he's standing tall because he knows he's a child of God and he knows he's going to be successful. Someone said that to me, and that's why I have to give it back that way. Because regardless if they're a great football player, basketball player, whatever, if they don't know who they are, if they don't know who they are, they're going to get lost. So what I'm trying to do, not only in ministry, but in teaching, is help the lost find their way. See, because a lot of us are blind and can't see. A lot of us are lame and can't walk. But if we teach them how to see, if we teach them how to walk, then we can have a better society. That's what Seattle Public School has done for me. That's what I'm doing with my life. And I thank you, Seattle Public Schools, for honoring me this way. Once again, it's been said over and over again, it's good to be honored at home. It's good to be loved at home. And I thank you. God bless you. And may the Lord keep you. All right, just a couple more here. Uh, Mark Haley worked at King County Metro for 34 years and also coached various sports at Rainier Beach High School for 32 years, including football for all 32. He also coached wrestling, track, and girls basketball, where he met our next inductee, Mark Haley. It's an honor to be here and have Tara ask me to introduce her. I met Tara when she was 13 years old, coming into Rainier Beach as a freshman. Her and the other five that came in together were a basketball team like none other. Went to state all four years. It was a ride. Uh, like I said, her, her competitive journey began at the age of five years old where she played on her sister's soccer team, her older sister. And from there, it continued at Rainier Beach High School. She was an all-metro performer in basketball, track, track and field, and soccer. She helped the Lady Vikings go to, state to the state tournament four straight years and was named Converse All-American her senior year. In track, she won state championships in 300-meter hurdles and also in the long jump and twice in the triple jump. She also led the Rainier Beach girls soccer team to its only title in all the years in soccer. She was an all-metro defender. At Washington, she was part of the women's basketball team in the 90s, where she enjoyed a successful four years, 
Two of those years, she was on the all Pac-10 team. She returned for her fifth year and focused on track, earning Pac-10 long jump championships. Her best mark of 20 feet, eight and a half inches in the long jump, and then 41, seven and three quarters in the triple one, triple jump, which was a triple jump record at the UW for 16 years, <laughs> putting her in the top performers at the UW. She joined the Seattle Reign in 1995-96 season, as you heard earlier, then played in New England Blizzard in 96-97. After the ABL, she played in the ABL Women's League with Seattle Reign. Then she went to Israel and played one year before returning to Seattle. Upon returning to Seattle, she got her master's degree in education leadership policy, focusing on intercollegiate athletic leadership. She's now working at the Seattle School District as an assistant athletic director. I present you Ms. Tara Davis. Wow, goodness, thank you, Mark. All of those things, I forgot some of those. Um, you know, I, uh, first of all, I'd like to give thanks and all honor to God. Without him, none of this is possible. So I'd like to thank God for all of, uh, all of this and where I am today. Okay, it's gonna <laughs> stay there. Um, and like Mark said, where it all began, I, I actually had the opportunity. My sister, she's actually the superstar. You know, I got to watch my sister at five years old. She was running on the soccer field, and I thought, hmm, we're on Beacon Hill at Van Assel Community Center. My sister's running up and down the field. My family's cheering her on. My mom, my dad, my older brother, everybody's like, go, Sean, go, Sean. I'm like, yeah, go, Sean. Ooh, okay. But it was at that moment I realized, you know what? I want to do that too. I want to play. Hey, mom, dad, can I play? You're too young. And I'm thinking, well, no, I'm not. Well, OK, OK. So I had an opportunity to see her, but I thought, you know what? I might be too young now, but what if I practice? What if I was good enough to be out there with them. It didn't, maybe my age wouldn't matter. And so I went home and practiced. I was at school, I practiced. At that time I attended Wing Luke Elementary. And I was actually in school with Mario, no he's not here, but Mario, he attended Wing Luke Elementary. So I had some people to look up to also, besides my sister, and actually compete against. So the next year rolled around, I'm six. Actually, you know what? I was six, she was eight. So the next year, I was seven. And I said, hey, mom, dad, it's time. And they looked at me, and they said, you're still, you're still too young. No, you can't play. And I thought, OK, you know what? In the back of my mind, I knew I had practice. I knew I had work. And I figured, if they just saw me, maybe they let me play. Maybe they let, allow me on the court. So what did I do? I tagged along with my sister. I went to her practices. I, I was like, OK, I'm not going to take no for an answer. You said no? That's fine. Just watch. So I went to her practices. I begged to participate. And I think, you know, at a certain point, I probably wore them down. <laughs> you can call it hard head. You can call it determined. But at a certain point, I ended up, and there's a picture of me in blue and yellow. And I'm on a team with young ladies that are two and three years older than me. And you know that was, that was my sign. That was, that was the first kind of no nonsense. I'm not taking no for an answer. I was truly determined. You know, athletics has always provided me with a sense and a place that I felt like I belonged. I learned teamwork. Right, <laughs> a good and healthy worth work ethic, but above all, for me, it provided me with passion and purpose. This purpose, it instilled in me the passion 
which has driven my actions to date. Being a student athlete at Rainier Beach, it was probably one of my best experiences. Having participated, like Mark said, I was in three sports four years. And it wasn't an obligation. It felt like a privilege. I got to do this. You know, today some kids are, I ask them, hey, you play sports? Oh yeah, I only, I only do one. And I'm thinking, but you're so talented. Do you know what track can do for basketball or for football or for your grades? If you stay busy and focused, what that can do for you? And for me, like I said, it provided me with purpose. I look back on my coaches during that time and now having coached myself and know all the time that goes into it, all the preparation, all the planning, it's hard. <laughs> and it's humbling now to know of the sacrifices and the services that my coaches provided to me. You know, it's not just the preparation on the court, but also off the court, trying to lead our student athletes to something more. You know, I, I, I remember back, um, I remember back just being a student athlete at Rainier Beach and having some hard times. My father, he passed away. My mom, as a single mother, and she was really, you know, she was really holding it down and showing us away. Um, and I saw so much strength in my mom. And at that time, I just, I thought, how is she doing this? And you know, she answered, she said, all things are possible through God. So I've been privileged to have a wonderful, wonderful team, not just on the court, not just a team of coaches, not just a team of teachers, but a team of good and strong people around me. From the strong women in my life, my mother, my Shiro, <laughs> yeah, I like that Shiro, um, my godmother Terry and my auntie Teresa. Um, I don't see her here, but uh, she's like a second mom to me. She always provided me with a hot meal. Her name is Alma. When I was in college, a hot meal and a place to stay. Alma, I'm coming, okay. <laughs> And also Cheryl Kay, who's sitting here right now. 32 years of support. All my friends here, my family. Like, uh, I think that was uh, Terry over there, or actually Billy North, he said it takes a village to raise a child. And he's right. My village of teachers and teammates and classmates and coaches at Rainier Beach, from Ben Wright to Mark Haley to Phil Brockman, Lamar Hurd, they all were instrumental in, in, in helping me become who I am today. In addition, my youth sport coaches, uh, Coach Flowers, he's not here. Some of you may know him, Bob Flowers, and also Coach Smith. They were very instrumental in that. Um, I know I wouldn't be where I am today without all the support and guidance of my coaches. The carpools, thank you, the discipline and also the love. I know it prepared me for the next level that I went to as a collegiate athlete. My family, they've always been here for me, rooting me on. My big sister, she set the tone. Sean, she's sitting there. I think Sheila, she mentioned her, and Karen did. But she set the tone and the benchmark for athletic greatness. Again, all these opportunities are possible through God, and I'm thankful for allowing me these experiences in athletics, for opening doors and creating for opening doors and allowing me a part, uh, allow me the opportunity to be part of great teams. I've enjoyed success on the court, on the field, and on the track, and also my current position. 
to be part of a great team with the Seattle Public Schools Athletic Department. See y'all sitting there. <laughs> I believe Eric McCurdy, he's a great leader. Thank you. And also a coach. He's drafted, in my opinion, a championship team with people like Pat McCarthy, who's not with us tonight. He's at the district championship, or districts. Also Greg Brashear, Kalani Igarda, Stephanie Perez, Jeremy Woods, who couldn't be with us tonight. I believe Travis McLeany, he had to leave. He's our newest member. I look forward to continuing to support our athletic programs at our 10 high schools, our 22 middle schools, and then also our unified programs as Director uh, Jill Gary, she, she spoke of. Like I said, I currently have an opportunity to coach one of our, to coach some of our athletes in the 2018 Special Olympic Games. Lastly, I know none of this is possible without the support of our district. So a special thanks to Dr. Flip Herndon for supporting our programs and also Dr. Larry Nyland. Thank you for believing in us and thank you for believing in educational-based athletics. God bless. CD. Thank you. I've had the pleasure of knowing Tara for a long time. She was a freshman and when I was a fifth year senior at UW. I won't tell the story about you falling asleep in the back of the bus. <laughs> and she actually went to the bus yard and woke up two hours later. The bus driver did not know she was in the back of the bus. <laughs> and nobody looked out for the freshman. And she literally woke up in the bus yard like two or two or three o'clock in the morning after a long road trip. I won't tell that story, but <laughs> But I've known Tara since the UW days. I got to know her again when I was the general manager of the Seattle Reign, and then I had the distinct pleasure of also being one of her professors when she achieved and received her master's degree at the University of Washington. Most importantly, I've gotten to know her as a mother and the strength and resilience you see and appreciate and love in your own mother, you too possess, Ms. Davis. Um, our next presenter is Daryl Powell, played quarterback for Garfield. Um, with the next inductee, went on to play for Tennessee State and later learned an MBA from Harvard. Daryl is currently the CFO for United Way of King County, and he and his wife are extremely active members in the Seattle community. Daryl Powell. Uh, thank you. Um, so I have the pleasure tonight and the honor to introduce a good friend of mine, Bruce Harrell. Um, I've known Bruce since uh, grade school, TT minor back in the uh, mid 60s. And so um, there's a couple of things on here that, uh, that are not on here that I need to tell you. Um, no matter how many accolades that I bestow upon Bruce tonight, he's gonna remind me of what I missed. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is, if you haven't met his beautiful wife, Joanne, or you know her, you know that he married up. So that said, um, you know, Bruce and I, like I said, we grew up together. We played together at Garfield High School where he was a talent and um, he comes from a, a legacy of talent of the Harold family, which was some of the names were mentioned tonight. Um, Bruce was class valedictorian and he was captain of our football team. Um, he, he received nine varsity letters. He was first team all Metro, all American, and he was the leader of our team. Uh, Bruce and I had the pleasure of playing in the 1975 game, a four overtime game that was ultimately named the game of the century in the 20th century. Uh, we lost, but we still take those accolades. Um, Bruce went on to college at the University of Washington and on a football scholarship, and he helped the resurgence of, of UW scholarship back in the 70s in the Don James era. Um, Bruce became a starting linebacker, an academic All-American, he led the Huskies in tackles, and he won a Rose Bowl and Sun Bowl while he was there. Bruce went on after college to become an esteemed attorney where he practiced. He served as an attorney in pri private practice and practiced with a, as a corporate attorney. Um, Bruce received the uh, UW Distinguished Alumni Award. Um, he's received the 2008 Husky Legend Award, and in 2013, he was inducted into the Pacific Northwest Hall of Fame as a college player. Um, uh, Bruce has taken on his advocacy and joined the, and was a winner of the uh, 
city council and became a city council member in 2007. And so please welcome uh, my, the councilman, a colleague, and my friend, Bruce Harrell. Thank you, Daryl Powell. I'd just like to continue that introduction a little bit, he, a little bit. he didn't miss a few things. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Seattle Public School District for putting me last on the program. That was a joke, um, because all the people I was going to think have left, except my family. Uh, in all seriousness, this has been a glorious evening, and I'm really proud to be uh, 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 just a, a small part of it. Uh, I want to, we've heard so many inspirational stories, and I just want to have one th share one thought with you. And that is this commonality of sports. I've heard tremendous athletes and their coaches talk about it. I constantly ask myself, uh, what inspires you? When, when you're young, we had great high school experiences and probably what inspired me was to get out of my neighborhood or to, be, to please my mother and father or my cousin or my brothers, to please my coaches. I was inspired by what I saw around me I thought that's what inspired me. But as I've gotten older, and I have friends and coaches that, again, have known me since I was eight or nine years old, I realize what actually inspires people is a voice. Now, that voice could come from within, and the voice for people of faith could come from God. The voice could come from a mother or father, from a coach. We've heard we've got many coaches here, great coaches. But it's always a voice. And I started thinking about that voice because I still, you see how good I look right now? I'm, you know, I can still bounce around. I can cross Sheila up. I could do it all. I, the voice, the voice, actually when I think about it, is always a voice of love. God is love. My wife inspires me every single day. My sister-in-law, my family here. It's always a voice of love. And they don't care whether you win or lose. So I thought about the reason I like this high school stuff is because I was probably very, very happy in high school. And when I think about what happened in Parkland, Florida, and what happens in high schools, and I spend a lot of time with the youth, and I know we have ministers out here and teachers and coaches, and I love the Seattle Public School District. This is a mar marvelous event. But I thought about that our voice, that we have to be the voice. That, that was what why we're here is to help the district have that voice because I was lucky. My mother and father went to Garfield. They met at Garfield. They got married. They married for 50 years. Big old black guy, little old Japanese woman. I don't know what they saw in each other, but they loved each other. <laughs> and they met at Garfield, and they were always that voice that said, I could do anything, right? And you guys had that too, right? Mr. Brothers, you, someone told you you could do whatever you want. And a lot of these children, they do not have that voice. They have another voice, a voice saying, you know, you're not going to amount to anything, or you're going to miss out, or this negative, these negative voices. So what I, my takeaway from these glorious stories, and that's the benefit of being almost last, is I heard the stories, I heard those voices, and it got me fired up again. So when I leave here, I'm going to run like five miles, do some push-ups. No, I'm just joking. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. <laughs> But I am inspired by the voice. So community, thank you for giving me your voice. Thank you, my family. OK, we do have one more. So last but not least, our next presenter is basketball legend Ernie Dunstan. Ernie probably needs no introduction, but a native of Washington, DC, been a resident of Seattle for more than 50 years came in 1959 to attend college at Seattle U, where he excelled as a basketball player on the Seattle U teams that were perennial NCAA participants, teammates including Elgin Baylor and John Tresvant. Early is a member of the Seattle University Athletic Hall of Fame. First of all, I was not a teammate of Elgin Baylor's. I'm a little younger than Elgin, but, uh, but we did, but we did come from the same high school in Washington, D.C. And um, I'm here tonight to uh, introduce uh, Bill Wright as a uh, Hall of Famer for Seattle Public Schools. And I first uh, knew Bill as a great basketball player. Bill's from uh, Franklin High School. He was an 
all city, all state in basketball and golf. And um, when uh, Elgin Baylor came out to Seattle, he had to sit out a year. He played for the West Side Forward AAU team. And Bill Wright was his teammate. And so we got to know uh, Bill that way. And then when Elgin was, uh, he was with the LA Lakers, he was drafted into the military and he uh, satisfied his military service by coming up to do his uh, service at Fort Lewis on the weekends. So he would come up uh, to Seattle and he would play, we play pickup games at CLU, CLU's old gym. And uh, Bill was, uh, so it's time sometime be up there playing when he was in town. But uh, Bill's um, background and his accomplishments are pretty well laid out in the program. I'd just like to highlight a couple of things. Uh, he was uh, the NAIA All-American in golf his senior year at Western Washington University. He was the first African-American golfer to win a USGA title, the 1959 US Amateur Public Links Championship. And um, he was a former member of the PGA Tour. And uh, in his, uh, uh, after, uh, after uh, leaving the tour, he spent many years as a teaching pro in Los Angeles at the uh, Lakes at El Segundo Golf Course. Um, I'm sure Dick will be very, Dick, I'm sure uh, Bill will be uh, very proud to add the Seattle uh, Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame to the long list of halls of fame that, that's listed on the program. Uh, this evening, uh, Bill, Bill uh, was not able, able to come up from uh, Los Angeles. He's having some health challenges. Uh, so tonight, uh, he's going to be represented by the wife and the son of one of his longtime friends and golf partners from Seattle, um, Joan Lydell and her son, Derek Lydell. Sure, sure. Step up here first. All right, uh, we're almost done. Um, first off, let's thank God again. Um, I want to thank all of you for the greatness in the room that we have. Uh, I've known a lot of you for years. Um, there's a group of people uh, from Collins Playfield. Uh, Uncle Paul might know of it. Uncle Charles, you guys might know of it. Uh, Bill speaks very highly of that place. Uh, he had good hands, and he would throw a mean curveball uh, at whoever was up to play. And I think that place gave him the attitude uh, that he needed. Uh, Definitely for basketball, but for golf, it was a total different story. Um, there was nobody before him uh, to do what he was doing. So I want to say thanks to those kids from Collins Playfield for building that attitude. Um, the next group is First Day Golf Club. Um, Bill's family and the, had to sue the city of Seattle with the help of uh, First Day Golf Club so that he could have a handicap. And as an amateur, you can't play in tournaments without a handicap. So here you are. Um, the best player in the city, or you believe you're the best player in the city, but you can't play golf. And so without uh, First State Golf Club and, and his family suing the city of Seattle, uh, African-American golfers would have not been able to play golf at that time. So once he established his handicap, uh, he went on to win a city junior title. Uh, he went on to win the USGA Public Links in 1954 uh, and do incredible things. He moved to LA because you can't play a lot of golf in the rain. Uh, so he went to L.A. probably late 50s, early 60s, and he taught in Watts, uh, still lives right off of Crenshaw and Baldwin Hills, uh, teaches, uh, was teaching, uh, and he was just a great teacher. I was lucky when I moved back to Seattle to pick up golf myself and get to play with him and just get the lessons that uh, he had, and, and a lot of it was that attitude from Collins. You know, if you've ever had somebody beat you and tell you how they're going to beat you, it takes a level of skill uh, <laughs> to do that. 
And so I'm very appreciative for the time that I had with him and my dad, uh, just to be able to listen to those stories. Um, and uh, like I said, a lot of it started at Collins Playfield. And then from there, he was able to go on to Franklin, win those basket, the basketball championships, uh, one of the first in the city. Uh, and then from there, Western Washington and, and do what he did. So he is a pioneer uh, for what we do in golf. And so I just want to also thank Bill for his life and his contribution to athletics in Seattle and uh, to the game of golf. So, thank you. And I just want to say I love Bill Wright. Okay, almost done. I want to first and foremost thank Karen Bryant. Thank you so much for being our MC this evening. And we had a great audience, great athletes, great inductees, outstanding leadership from Seattle Public Schools. And I think one of the themes that if you were listening to what some of the inductees were saying, it really would not have happened without an awful lot of help and support. So, a way that you can support us if you are so inclined tonight. A little bit on the back page is something called the Seattle 500. We are looking for folks that will step up to contribute a minimum of $500 a year for a couple of years. Heck with all that paperwork, there's just an envelope and some forms there if you wish to write a check, put a credit card down. It's going to allow us to do a couple of things, to support the transportation that Eric talked about. It's also to support Unified, which is an incredible and amazing way, I think, to help some young people, very special young people. And one day, we're going to have something other than a virtual Hall of Fame for Seattle Public School Athletics. So Dr. Herndon is working on that now. It will not be announced for a little while yet, but we hopefully will have something physical, and that's another way we can support. So to all of you, if you feel like being a little bit generous, we'd love to have it. Thank you so very, very, very much for coming. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you to the WAC, Mr. Bowler, 101. Drive safely and just have a wonderful rest of the evening. Thank you.